Right. Welcome everybody. Welcome to our online viewers. Uh, we thank you for choosing us tonight. Uh, if you like what you hear today, there is a Give Here button uh, on the home page uh, for myamc.org. Now the third row from the top of the page, if you look to the right and to the bottom page, right down uh, in the lower right, there should be a big uh, red donate button. You can't miss it. Uh, you can find all of our teachings by searching the internet using a single keyword, My AMC Media Group. Uh, our videos will they'll come up in a nice ordered list. If you have a smartphone, tablet, PC, uh, whatever, we've uh, put a lot of work into that, and so we just greatly encourage you uh, out there, if you like this ministry, to give to this ministry, and our aim is uh, not only to preach the truth, but we want to explain it uh, to you uh, as well. So tonight what we have is, is I'm going to continue on. Uh, this is an important message, uh, part four. We're going to continue on in the book of Philippians. And the theme uh, tonight, again, is, is joy in times of trouble. So this is, this is what we all need. We all need an encouraging word consistently during this season in our life. And so uh, that's w what uh, the Lord has put on my heart. Uh, now tonight, really, like every Friday night, uh, it's an appointment of the Lord. Not, not just another, it's not just another Friday night. Uh, every time we meet here, we have to understand that this is a unique appointment. They're all unique. Uh, and sometimes we continue on with, you know, maybe a theme that's, that's important for that particular week or, or, or weeks. Um, other times, it's something new. It's something refreshing. Sometimes the Lord wants to refresh us. Uh, but sometimes the preaching fits exactly as to where we are in these yearly cycles and appointments uh, of the Lord. And so tonight uh, is, is, is no different. Uh, we are about to close out the month of Tammuz. Right. Now, anybody out here or online can, can recall what Tammuz begins. What, what are we coming to the end of the beginning of the first part of? What, what is that? Okay, so it's, it's, it's the summer season, right? The summer season in Israel. It's th really three months. It's Tammuz, Av, and Elul. Those are the roughly June, July, and August, roughly. And so it's interesting, I believe this is correct, that there are no Jewish holidays in Tammuz. I think. Okay, very good, okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's named after a Babylonian sun god. It's kind of a unique uh, month in itself. And we, what, when, what do we know about uh, these, these days? These days are, they're long, and they're hot, long and hot days. And, and summertime for the Jewish people uh, often reminds them, uh, if you're in Israel, of the harsh realities, particularly in the next month that's to come, in the month, month of Av, which will draw upon us this Sunday. Uh, so if you think back, to the lessons. Let's go back a few months. Let's go back to the winter. If you look at the lessons of Hanukkah, uh, learned in the dead of winter, you'll remember that there is always light shining even in, in the darkness, in the darkness of winter. Uh, this Hebrew month, Tammuz, teaches us it's really, if you think about it, it's the inverse of this lesson. There is also darkness in the light. Right? A lot of light, but there's some darkness in that. In the secular world, you know, summer means uh, no school. It's 
vacations, a lot of barbecues, carefree afternoons. But if you look to the ancient Jewish calendar, you can see that the scorching light of summer can also bring deep and challenging lessons about mourning and grief. Police officers, for instance, in Israel, will tell you that crime rates are highest in the summer. A sharp example of what the Hebrew calendar is trying to explain. The, the rays of the sun are at their harshest. The passion of the unrelenting light is powerful. And if it's misdirected, it causes us humans to do what we do. And what happens? We, we get overheated. We become impatient. And we become quick to anger. The light of the sun becomes what? It becomes blinding, limiting. We're sweating. Let's get out of the heat. Let's get in the shade. This is why in Tammuz it tells us to pay very close attention uh, to the emotional heat of the month. We are to pay, we are really focus on, 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 on what what we're dealing with in this month. Again, if it's in, in undirected, it can be brutal, intense, and cause us to lose ourselves in anger, right? Like Moses did. He struck the rock. It's hot, probably a hot day, right? A lot of pressure on him. He struck the rock impatiently, demanding, demanding water from God. Even, even Moses got overheated. Uh, but fortunately, it's not all heat and anger uh, and uphill climbing. Uh, for, for some of you who are here tonight, I, I would ask you, on you when you leave tonight on the back table, uh, before you leave, there's two handouts. Uh, one I made up. Five prayers to pray for Israel during the month of Av. Plus an additional handout uh, for prayers to pray for, for, for Arizona uh, by bridge builders. There's a lot of critical things that bridge builders has taken upon themselves uh, to put out a clarion call to all its members to pray for in Arizona right now. So take a copy of those, one of each. But even with all of this summer heat, uh, we can, if we follow what it says in the word, we can experience joy. We can experience joy in times of trouble. We, we have a very challenging month coming up. Uh, when it comes to following the Lord uh, as prayer intercessors for Israel, perhaps maybe uh, no greater need for that than this coming month ahead of us. Uh, during one of its greatest times where Israel needs us here. Every, every Messianic congregation in Israel should be uh, diligent about doing this right now as we prepare for uh, this, this, this month ahead of us. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about Tishba'av, right? Tishba'av is the ninth of Av coming. Uh, and I think it's July 17th or 19th this year. I'm not sure, but it's somewhere around that time. That's where it falls in the calendar right now. This is, this is July the 9th. That's why I put those out there for you to take. Be praying. I find that this works greatly and I see evidence of this with the Lord always when you can pray ahead of something don't pray when you're in it or it's gotten behind you you're at a tremendous disadvantage you pray ahead of something we're praying ahead right now at the ninth of all but we need some motivation uh, so we have that tonight with this book of Philippians uh, experiencing the joy of the Lord really uh, during a dark time. 
Now remember what I, in the last couple of messages, Paul is, he's chained to a Roman soldier, awaiting trial, doesn't know what the outcome is going to be, um, when he wrote this letter. And so for us in Arizona, Arizona, we're dealing with kind of a similar situation. We've got drought, right? We've got fire. Literally a skyrocketing murder rate. I've never seen this before. Skyrocketing murder rate. And it's all on all of our minds. Let's just put it out there. A stolen election. A stolen election. It's a season in. And so with regard to this election, I, I was on a, on a walk with the Lord this week, just like most of you here have, have asked this and even online is, um, what happened, Lord? You know, what happened, Lord? Where are we going? Could you allow this to happen? And so I was talking to the Lord about this and uh, you know, I just was stop, I was stopped in my tracks. I, I was on a walk and, and the Lord said, how, how dare you? How dare you question me? I can, in a moment's amount of time, fill every reservoir up. I can put every fire out. And who are you to question me about the outcome uh, of what you call a stolen election? Who are you? And so I had to step back. And it's all been part of this, this season I'm in right now where the Lord is trying to, to explain to me and, and, and work with me on who I am and who he is. Who am I and who is he? Going back and forth each day. Who am I and who are you? So that was a moment, a weak moment. Right? And... Uh, so I, I thought about that, and I said, for, forgive me, Lord. And, and then, then I didn't hear from him uh, for a while. I kind of, a cu- couple hours went by, and th- this is what he, s- he said to me. This may have come as a result of uh, watching something. Y- y- have, have you ever watched these shows where you see this, this inexperienced, like, rehabber, right? He wants to get into rehabbing a house, buys a house, only to discover, right? He only discovers that the house is full of bugs. So, so then what happens? The rehabber goes out and he, he contracts with this, maybe he gets a cheap, inexperienced pest control company that says, oh, ah, we can do the job. You know, maybe that's what happened with us. You know, we can go back and remember, um, we saw an opportunity back in 2016. We'd had enough. We had eight, eight years or whatever it was of this and, we, we saw an opportunity. And what happened? We had a group of people. There were many people praying for change all over the world, especially here in the United States, and especially organized on a lot of these prayer lines. Um, however, you know, uh, whence, you know, uh, the president got elected, uh, he gives the inauguration speech, and, and you can tell. I know I was watching it that the battle lines are already being drawn. Right? They're, they're already being drawn. The church, I really feel, w- was, was not prepared for what they were up against. They, they were like that, like that rehabber, right? He goes out and he hires the company. And company says it's going to do something. Okay, take care of you. If you remember, what happened? Let's go back a little bit and let's run through a little bit of this scenario. The president came in. He came in with, with zero political experience. And, and remember, the entire White House staff was under fire from day one, right? Look at day one. Uh, he had trouble keeping anybody in any position for more than a couple of weeks. It was total, total chaos. How many cabinet changes did we see? How many chiefs of staff changes? Uh, his, his motivation on the surface seemed very justified. But really, what was he up against? He was up against monumental evil. Monumental evil. Plus, he had the entire mainstream media against him. Right? 
And what happened was the body never really came together after the election. Uh, I didn't see a mobilization of prayer like we did before the election. It's almost like, okay, we win. Okay, now take over. Take over. Uh, and yeah, when we saw the results, I think for me, uh, I, was, I was still uh, in, in a state of disbelief. And, uh, and, and right after the election, you know, especially... Uh, in Georgia, you know, we set up that that AMC intercessory post-election prayer line. We advertised it for weeks. We even extended it into December. Fact of the matter is, we barely had two or three people on any one of those calls, except for the initial weekend. May have had seven or eight total. Many times it was just Cheryl and I on these calls. Uh, contrast that with what I personally experienced in June of 2016. 60, 80, 220 people one night on a single one hour prayer call to pray for this election. One call, one hour. That was the kind of magnitude we had. Instead, what do, we, what do we get? In 2020, we, we did have one event. We had it. We broadcasted it here. Uh, it was the capital event in September. But really, after that, it fizzled out. It fizzled out. We didn't see any kind uh, of springboard to, to, to prayer and, and, and revival. All we really saw was, uh, you know, the, the almost like a panic mode. If we would have pushed forward with the same kind of fervor that we did, uh, outcome would have been different. But, um, and so I was thinking about that, recalling that, and, and so what, what the Lord said, you need to trust me. You need to trust me. Uh, perhaps if what's going on, maybe it's something like this, the evil that we saw was greatly exposed, but what if? What if there is way more evil out there that still needs to be exposed? Perhaps the Lord is saying, are you going to trust me, church? Are you going to trust me to expose even the great level of evil which I could not have done had the pres if the president would have won by a landslide, we would have gotten all we wanted, we would all be happy campers. Really, where would we be today? Would we be better off spiritually or not? That's a, that's a good question to ask. Right? When, we're, when we're in times of trouble, the Lord works. He, he's, he's working behind the scenes. It's like that house I was telling you about. You know, you, know, you get this inadequate, incompetent pest, pest control company that says, oh, <laughs> we're, we're going to take care of it. Only to lack the follow through. The contract ends, they get paid well, spray a little here, spray a little there. Uh, but they fail. What they fail to do is they fail to go on and do what they were supposed to do. And what they were supposed to do was this. They were supposed to be diligent. They were supposed to go behind all those walls and look and, and inspect and examine and push through like, like we should have had as a church. We should have pushed through. We should have been, we should have been in more prayer right after that inauguration speech. It just seems to be like a balloon popped. We win, there was celebration. Um, there should have been more prayer lines set up. Um, and heh, think about this, we had, we had two impeachment trials, but did we see any kind of a mass mobilization? We didn't, we, we saw pieces here, pieces there. We should have been gathered. We should, we should have sent a message. The church should have sent the message out there to, to all those people that were trying to do this, saying, you are not going to subvert this country with your evilness. And it should have been clear as a bell. So again, you have this half-hearted pest company that's gone, and uh, 
and, and now it's time for the construction crew to show up. And what happens? They start framing, and the minute they start taking down the walls, out becomes thousands, thousands of these bugs. That's what we're at right now. We're, we're that the, the, the stuff is coming out all the time that we never would have experienced. So now the entire house has got to be gutted, its foundation, before any real construction, any real repentance... Any real revival uh, can begin. And I want to, uh, oh, the Lord reminded me of this. If you have your Bibles, I want to re be reminded, uh, if you can pick up uh, Isaiah 55. It's a great section here that goes along. It goes along with Second Chronicles 7 and 13 and 14. It's a good, good verse to pair, pair yourself on. I'm going to read Second. Uh, Isaiah 55, verses 7 through 12. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts and your outcome. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing where to I sent it. We need to remember that when we're going on our phones and, and doing a news check. All right, We need to remember that. Where you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing and all the trees of the fields shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. That's the kind of faith we need to have uh, in, in these times right now. And so couple that with, with 2 Chronicles 7, 13, and 14, and you'll get, a, I think, a, a beautiful picture of what the Lord is trying to tell us. And so that's what I think is a prescription for what, how, what we need to be dealing with in these, in these you know, hard, hard times. We need to find the joy of the Lord. Do we trust the Lord with what's going on? And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to pick up where we left off in chapter 3 because there are, man, so many verses here that speak of how we as Christ Christians deal uh, or should be dealing with all this chaos around us and set ourselves apart uh, as those rejoicing rejoicing in our tribulations, knowing that the tribulations work patience. That's Romans 5, verse 3. There's more of that in chapter 3. Let's go to chapter 3. If you got your Bibles out, verse 1. I'll pick up there. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Sincere Christians rejoice in Yeshua HaMashiach in all circumstances. Verse 2. I think this is appropriate. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Make a note in the closing. Uh, I'm going to make a note in the closing tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about evil workers a little bit. The prophet Isaiah called the false prophets dumb dogs. That's where he's quoting from here. Isaiah 56.10. Dogs for their malice against faithful professors of the gospel of Yeshua, barking at them and biting at them. They urge human works in opposition to the faith of Yeshua. But Paul calls them evil workers. He calls them the concision as they rent the church of Yeshua and cut it into pieces by dividing it, by preaching false doctrine. The work of religion is of no purpose unless the heart is in it, unless it's a changed heart. 
We must worship God in the strength and the grace of the Holy Spirit. We rejoice in Yeshua, not in mere outward enjoyments and performances or in reports. If the apostle would have glorified and trusted in the flesh, he had as much cause as any man. But the things which he counted gain while a Pharisee and had reckoned up, those he counted, he counted those as lost for Yeshua. He was, he was a smart man, he was educated, he counted them as lost for the knowledge of Yeshua. By faith in his person and salvation. He speaks of all worldly enjoyments and outward privileges which sought a place with Yeshua in his heart or could pretend to any merit and, and, and desert and counted them as loss. But it might be said, it's, it's easy to say so, but what would he do when it came to the trial? He had suffered the loss of all privileges of a Christian. Really, he was chained to a Roman soldier. They lost everything. But no, he didn't count them as lost. But the vilest refuse, offals thrown to dogs, not only less valuable than Yeshua, but in the highest degree contemptible when set up against him. True knowledge of Yeshua and trusting him alters and changes men. It should alter and change us. Their judgments and manners and make them as if made again anew. As believers, we need to prefer in the ways of Yeshua, knowing that it is better for us to be without all worldly riches than without Yeshua and his word. We are undone without righteousness wherein to appear before God, for we are guilty. There is a righteousness provided for us in Yeshua HaMashiach. And it is a, it's, comp it's a complete and perfect righteousness. None of us can have benefit by it who trust in ourselves, trust in man and, and in trust in the things um, and, and in the rudiments of this world. Faith is the appointed means of applying the saving benefit provided to us through the gift of salvation that is of Yeshua only. It is by faith in Yeshua's blood we are made conformable to his death when we die to sin and live for righteousness. And we are to look at the cross as a beginning and not as an end. I think a lot of the church today has it reversed. They look at it as an end. We look at it as just a beginning. The apostle was willing to do or suffer anything to attain the glorious resurrection of the saints. And how many times do we hear him say, Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. This hope and prospect carried him through all the difficulties in his work. He did not hope to attain it through his own merit and righteousness, but through the merit and righteousness of his Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach. As I, I talked about uh, in the message a couple of weeks ago, um, I left off with Philippians 3.13. Uh, go to your Bibles, you can uh, pick it up from there. But I want to finish that thought today, tonight with Philippians 3.14. So if we can bring up uh, that slide. Philippians 3.14 says this, I press toward the mark the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm going to read you the transliteration of this. According to the goal I am chasing on the prize of the upcalling of the God in anointed Jesus. And I'm just going to add, I'm going to read the, the Greek part of this because we need to look at some of these Greek words. Katoskopan dioko to ion tes ano Kehesos, Tose, and Christo, Iesu. And so I want to focus on two of the words in here because they're very important. This word here, Dioko, it's Strong's G1377. And 
And what does it mean? It means to run swiftly in order to catch a person or a thing. A uh, picture I have uh, is a seasoned police officer or an FBI agent uh, when they're in pursuit of an assailant and they capture him. There's training involved in doing that, maybe years, physical training. That's what this word is talking about, to run swiftly in order to catch a person or thing, to press on figuratively as one who is in a race, We're in a race, running swiftly to win the race. Dioko. The second word I want to focus on here is brabion, brabion, prize. What's the prize? It's something, it's, uh, I'm going to back up here, it's Strong's G1017, Brabion. This is to award to, to the victory in the games a prize. So something you're striving for, something you look uh, to be given in, in great esteem. So, looking at this again, focus on these two words, you'll get maybe perhaps a deeper meaning uh, of what it means to press toward the mark. Press, 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 press toward the mark for the high calling of God uh, in Christ Jesus. And so I'm going to close with this. Are we as believers truly pursuing pressing are we pressing are we understanding this that Satan's minions they're in the same race ever, ever think about it that way they're in the same race we're in what's the race for the race is for our very soul You ever feel sometimes like you have some competition? Or are you so far behind that you don't even know you're in the race? Uh, like I said uh, in last night's Power Hour prayer, I said this, uh, are you content with going through life, having your glass of milk to get you through the day. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. You get up every day. Thank you, Lord, for saving me now. Um, and I have my glass of milk. Not knowing, not knowing, and there are many believers out here because they've been duped by the church. There are many believers out here who are going through life like this. They're, they're not even aware that the leaders of the pack in this race, right, they might be your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ that maybe the Lord is trying to make you aware of. And they're at the front of the pack. Why are they at the front of the pack? You know why? Because they've been eating meat and potatoes for years. They, they decided to get off the milk. And they're way ahead of you. And if you, don't, if you don't understand that you're in a race right now, how could you possibly know you're, you're, you're behind? Um, so the question is this, is where are you? Where are you in this race? Do you even feel like you're in a race? Uh, so I used to, I did some long distance running, so, uh, so when you're in this race, you're supposed to put on the, uh, the full armor of God, right? So when you're in a race, what, what does the armor of God look like when you're in this race? You get up every morning. What does it look like stru so strategically when you're in a long distance race and you're a part of a team, right, a team of mishpaka? Uh, what happens? You get together and you have a strategy, right? You create a strategy. Um, 
And so what happens? The best runners will pick out the best competition. And what do they do? They strategically wait until what? They strategically wait for the opportune time to box in their, component, their opponent. They box them in. That's what we should be doing every day in this race because Satan is in the race with us. What are we doing every day to box him in? Box him in. We contain him. As a married couple, is a great example, right? As friends, as Mishpacha in this congregation, you are to box those evil angels in every day. You give them no way out. Because when you cross that finish line, what happens? They're done. They're done. And your prize is what? Hopefully, it's the kingdom. Your reward is the kingdom. Now, is that how you, is that how you go about your day? Uh, we all have ups and downs, but maybe that's because that competition is trying to move you a little bit out, to the left or to the right. You're in a race, as, Ra as Rabbi Allen has said many times, we are to be overcomers. We're in a race. You cannot win a race until you overcome in the race. Right? I don't mean finish the race. There are many milk-drinking believers who just might finish the race. No, we have to win. Even in these evil days, there are, there are harder days coming right around the corner. Nevertheless, the example we have tonight is what? We rejoice in our tribulations. So I'm going to do the offering here and, and, and close with just a short uh, message. Um, I'm going to ask my wife to come up and do the ironic benediction, but before I do that, uh, again, I want to say, um, ask yourself this question tonight, where am I in this race? You know, there are many, many churches today that are merely set up to, to do what? They gather people with no coordinated plan to change their lives because wh why? The word being spoken is, is null uh, and it's based on these personal experiences that these people have during the week, it's, it's, it's not, people leave unchanged. They come in, they go out. It's kind of like the grocery store. They go in, they see something, they come out, you know, not changed. And so ask yourself that, th this question tonight. Um, and I believe it starts with this, with those little spiritual disciplines that you need to put in place um, right now, right now to keep you from falling behind. They're little things. The Lord will trust you with the little things before he's going to give you uh, the big things. And uh, ponder that tonight and, and rejoice that the Lord is in it and he wants you to trust him during this very, very difficult time. Amen? Well, before I close tonight, I just wanted to make a comment. We were in Philippians today talking about that um, uh, verse in chapter 3 about evil workers. So Paul talks about being beware of the dogs and beware of evil workers. And uh, so we need to be careful about that, um, especially in these end times when we're dealing with uh, the challenges that we have in our with with our brothers, fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord, um, we could be, and we're going to be challenged uh, in the days and weeks ahead with uh, even more discernment we're going to need in dealing with uh, these evil workers because Satan's been working behind the scenes uh, for many many years and decades right now. I just, just want to say this, is that um, God is a God of consistency. And he says this, James 1.8, a double-minded man 
It's unstable in all of his ways. Somebody who says something, put to the test, change their mind. We have to see that come up and coupled right along with that is this, really. Daily I will test you. What are you made of? How far are you going to test me? Are you going to test me right to the end? Anyway, all right, I'd like to invite up uh, uh, my, my wife, Pastor Cheryl. She's going to do uh, the ironic benediction. Bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance toward you and give you the peace, the peace of the Sar Shalom. Be blessed, traveling mercies, uh, and good night.